All right, beginning part four. Uh, we was talking about the uh, installation of the old, the newer pool back in the 50s, and he's talking about having a, they had to drain the pool and then clean it, scrub it, sanitize it and all before they refilled it. So you can pick up on that if you want to, John. Well, those were the days when uh, I grabbed any job I could get or things just to keep me busy, not necessarily jobs. And I worked everything on the place. And one of the things I helped with was lifeguarding. Mm -hmm. Although I'm the official lifeguard, I would sit up there on a chair with the official lifeguard, a fellow named Comrade Knauts. His real name's Comrade, but he goes by CW today. His, his father was a, a, one of the establishing members of, of Dumas. Ed Knauts, a jeweler, and today Comrade is a, a lawyer up in Pickett, Arkansas. Well, Comrade and I spent a lot of hours up on those lifeguard towers um, watching the people swim. Mm -hmm. And some of the people that were down there swimming were uh, Charles Dainty, uh, Jerry Tannenbaum. Jerry Tannenbaum almost drowned me a number of times. Right now he lives down in Hot Springs. I'm going to call him. We're going to meet for lunch and I'm going to... We're going to talk about him trying to drown me when he was oh, man. Yeah, like need four or five years older yeah, than me. And you I was, need to put him in check on that. Uh, well, anyway, those were fun days. And, uh, ben Cahey would never come to the pool. Travis, his dad, would not let him come. Hmm. And I asked his dad one time, I said, But Cahey, when are you going to let Ben come to the pool? <laughs> oh, someday. Maybe. And that stuck in my mind, you know. Right. That's the most hopeless answer I've ever heard in my life. Someday, maybe. Right. I don't think Ben ever got his feet. He never did get pool. committed to that at all. But yeah, like. because his dad wouldn't let him go. Mm hmm. Uh, but we we had good times. And uh, I tell you, hold up that picture. Uh, let me pause here so we can focus on that. Three. Okay. What we have here is a picture taken from <clears throat> virtually the front door of our old house, the big white house, frame house that's gone now, but it was next door to the Pickens house. And looking directly uh, down the sidewalk, across the railroad track, depots on the right, the old commissary on the left is before the thing burned, so this had to be 46... 45, 46, 47, somewhere along in there. Uh, right to left on the right side is Andrew Pickens, born in 41. He's in the striped shirt there. Striped shirt, so estimate his age from 1941, and that would have dated a picture better. The girl in the middle is my sister Janice. She is uh, two years old. She was two years older than me, born in 30. Four. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, 36. 36. And me on the left, I was born in 38. And I would come tearing out our front door and run down that sidewalk, which is in a very bad state of repair, you can see. Pass that big old tree and leap that railroad track in one bound and be in that store. Of course, the new store is in the same site, only it's facing the... Uh, Facing the north, right. Mm -hmm. Facing that parking lot where the old one you see now is facing railroad track. Okay. And then that's the railroad depot, you say, on the right? That's the depot there on the right. It, uh, was that in use at that time? Oh, yes. Very much. Uh, Ms. Carpenter mm -hmm. worked there, and her she had a son named David, and he would come there and stay there after school. He'd ride our bus back here. And after she got off at like three or four or five o'clock, whatever, I think they lived in Tiller. And then she'd get in the car and they'd go home to Tiller. But um, this train would not necessarily stop there. 
every once in a while he would stop and offload or pick up something out of that big bay door on the right there. And there was always a few big boxes in there. We'd get in there and play every once in a while, play cops and robbers in there. Mm -hmm. The trains mostly stopped for the gym. They would go on down to the left more, pull off on a, a side track, and maybe leave a few cars there for flat cars there to pick up bales of cotton on uh, on the next run. Um, they had a post down. I think the post was down here somewhere. To where if they had something to give the train, they could hang it up in a bag. Um on that post and the train could go by there full speed and grab that bag oh. and keep going. And they could, I guess the train could throw something out too if it, it was a mail bag or something. Keep having to stop. But that was Missouri Pacific Railroad at the time. And uh, I got to where I could just sleep through that thing Train's going through there in the middle of the night. Oh, yeah. I live that close to the track on the very place. You get used to that after a while. Yeah. You got that? Go. The uh, gym was another favorite place we liked to play. And it's amazing. Kids could play in these areas back then where they wouldn't be allowed today. OSHA would take the owners and the managers to court and put them yeah. in jail. Well, I slipped off down there a few times, too. If they let kids play the Oh, yeah. We would get out there, and we would be inside the gym watching the big press come down and press those things and wrap the cloth around it and the big steel bands and then press the lid off and the bale expand. And we were out there watching the whole thing. And then we will watch them put a big bale. These bales weigh 50, 500 to 550 pounds. And put it on one of these uh, carts and two wheel carts and roll it up that ramp, which took some muscle on there. I imagine. And up to the big dock where they had all the bales stacked up. And then we'd play out there, up on the bales, jumping from one to another, and running around. Uh, that area, the shop platform uh, slab we played. Uh, the lake bank, the old bridge, the old bridge between the town and the, the uh, country club was our one of our favorite places. It's kind of like now. It was, it, was, it was wood, no sides. Well, it had sides. Oh, it had sides then? Oh, okay. Uh, but wood sides. Oh, okay. And it uh, had some things down parallel down the middle, like boards you could drive on, and the other boards between them were or under them were sideways. And those on the top you were driving on, they'd get loose every once in a while, pop up and flop around mm -hmm. or drive over. But we'd mainly go down there and play off that bridge to uh, fish and hunt for gar. Mm -hmm. We'd see those big gar swimming around in the lake down there, and they were alligator gars, I don't know, two, three, four, five, six feet long, however long they had been left alone. And we'd fish for them, we'd take a chunk of pork, pork fat, and put a hook on it, to maybe the inch between the shaft of the hook and the return, and drop that over the side on a big cord. You didn't need a pole. Tied up, tied up on the bridge uh, rail. And some old guard grabbed that thing, we'd pull it out of the water and we'd decide then whether we wanted to wrestle with it or not. <laughs> if not, we cut the string. <laughs> and sometimes we took uh, rifles down there, which is uh, no doubt against the law. I know it is now. And we'd shoot those things with 22s. And um, we'd walk the railroad trestle next to it and without fear of a train, of course, you could see for miles. Oh, yeah. And you could hear the whistle. You know. Yeah. And uh, just a wonderful place to grow up. I mean, Same with I me. could not pick 
of all the places I've been in this world, I could not pick a better place. Well, I wish I was around to play with you guys. You sound like y'all had a blast. To have spent my youth. I did too. And uh, that's why I'm wanting to keep talking about this place because it had a big part in my life and as well as yours. Yeah. So, um, listen, I need to wrap it up. Uh, you know, you just talking about what year you graduated, say 56? 56. And then you went to um, our, uh, Washita Baptist University. It was a college back then. I'm well, the university. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. And then did you complete that or was you drafted and how did you transition uh, in the military? Four years there and graduated and uh, got a commission in R through the ROTC. Went immediately into the Army and uh, spent 20 and a half years active duty in the Army. Now, four years after I graduated, the Army sent me back to Washita oh. to teach ROTC. And see these annuals up here, the ones on the left when I was there as a student. The two gray ones, that was my first wife and I got, each got an annual that year. Mm -hmm. And she didn't go back to school enough to get an annual. And then the ones laying flat are when I was there teaching ROTC. I see, okay. So I spent 12, or not 12, seven years there, but not all of it as a student. <laughs> I see, I see. And I left the family there, both tours in Vietnam. And uh, I got a lot of time wrapped up in Arkadelphia. I see. Good deal. Nice place. Well, John, I wish we could just go on and on. Uh, it, it has been an honor to talk with you, share your memories about uh, the wonderful place men you both love. That's uh, Pickens, Arkansas. And uh, I hope the folks enjoyed this fascinating interview with this honorable man I'm talking with, John Eddington McCowan, senior, patriot, served this country 20 something years. Uh, we, we appreciate your service in the military, John, and, uh, and we uh, appreciate you sharing your eyewitness accounts of the, the Pickens history, the wonderful people that is what really makes Pickens what it is or any other place is the, the great people that live at these places anywhere in the world. And, uh, of course, uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me, Pickens is very special to us, and uh, and I'm glad you shared the history because history should be shared and preserved. And I believe you accomplished both of those things today by talking a little bit about it. You shared about your McCowan and Eddington families, which were pioneer families. A lot of people don't know that uh, like they should, but those the roots of your family, the McCowans and the Eddingtons run deep in DeShea County. And I think people need to know about them. And I encourage everybody watching uh, to get involved with the, the historical societies such as Deshea County Museum, Deshea County Historical Society, because there's a lot of rich history that's dying with people. If we don't document it, we don't uh, uh, support these uh, entities, uh, history is going to fade away and, and won't be preserved for future generations yet to be born. So I appreciate you um, your insights today. Uh, this will all be recorded and also documented in, in paper form for uh, future generations, and I think you're Thank you, John, for sharing uh, your thoughts and memories with us. And um, I'm going to go ahead and close now. Any final thoughts you'd like to say to anyone that's watching today? No, I appreciate um, being a part of this very much. And uh, thank you for your hard work. I know it's not easy. I know it takes a lot of time. <clears throat> I'm also thankful for my nephew, George Harvey Anderson, who is my oldest sister, Jean's oldest son. He was born four days after Grover Cleveland Eddington died. Oh. If Grover Cleveland Eddington had lived four more days, he would have had a great grandson, like uh, I do now. Wow. Mm. So close. And time, just one more thing. Sure. Time creeps up on you. You just don't realize it. I have a great grandson. He's seven months old now, and I'm 75. My great grandfather died in 18, 1880. That was what, 58 years before I was born? No, 48 years. Wow, somewhere like that, yes. Wow. 58 years. 
before I was born or something like that. I was born in 38, 1938. He died in 1880. My great grandfather. He never knew his great grandson. Mm -hmm. I've got one. He's getting so, it so, so it just tells you what our lifespans are doing these days. Life uh, gets longer. It's, like you say, very important to look back. And I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate you. And uh, look forward to meeting you again.